building blocks where we build faith from the ground up. What is Passover? What does it represent? And how does it apply to us? Uh, well, to me as a Christian. Pesach, which is Passover. The ordinance of Passover is established during the time when God was bringing 10 plagues onto the land of Egypt. God elevated the man Moses to be a temporary intercessor for the Hebrew people. Moses called for Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go from their bondage. Pharaoh would not, so God had to humble the nation. The Hebrews were spared of nine plagues except for the 10th, the death of every firstborn. This is documented in the 11th and 12th chapter of Exodus. So basically what's going on here is uh, the Hebrews, you know, they basically went from the land they came from. Jacob brought the rest of his family. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, um, he, be, he came into a position of power and there was famine in the land of, of Israel. So the, the people... Um, Joseph's fa he brought all his family over because he was in a position of high power and the, and the Jews prospered in, in Egypt for, for many years and the generations grew until the time where um, a new Pharaoh took over and didn't like the Hebrews commun sense of community and strength in numbers and felt threatened. So they started treating the Hebrew people harshly and put them in bondage and put them in slavery basically. And they were enslaved for many years. And um, along came this guy, Moses, who actually grew up as an Egyptian, but uh, came to the realization that he was actually, in fact, Hebrew and started standing up for his people. And God called him to a, a high rank amongst his people and used him to do many great things. So that's the part we're in now in the Exodus, right? They're, they're, they're exiting Egypt. And we're in the part where God is bringing on these different plagues. There's 10 different plagues here. So the Seder plate. So we're, this is what the Seder plate looks like. Um, this is uh, the dinner that they eat um, at the night of Passover. So we'll get to that. That's just a picture I want to do. Seder means order. The Seder is the symbolic celebration and reflection on the Hebrews' experience in slavery. There's candles, wine, mats, and a special plate containing six items that represent both grief and joy. The items are carpus, which are greens. It's usually represented in the form of fresh parsley, and this represents life. It is dipped at a certain point in the ceremony. What they do is they wash their hands first, and then it's dipped into salt water to remember the tears of Israel while they were in bondage. And it could also be figurative of Moses uh, parting the Red Sea. There's different um, ways that this can be interpreted. But for the most part, if you ask someone, they're going to say that the parsley is represents a life dipped in the salt water. So it's a, a life of bondage is a life of tears. So it's to remember Israel's tears. Maror. The bitter herbs or the horseradish root is usually what it's represented by. And this represents the harshness of Egypt, the bitter feeling that the Hebrews endured. Chazaret is also the bitter herb. So it's like usually the maror, you'll have like an actual like horseradish root just sitting there and it's a visual example. But then you'll also have e either shredded horseradish or onion or a piece of uh, lettuce root and that you actually eat with the matz. And uh, that represents the, the, the tasting of the, the bitter affliction of slavery. Charoset is a sweet mixture of walnut, apples, cinnamon, raisins, dates. And it has like a thick um, consistency, texture. And this represents the mortar that was used to make bricks for Egypt during slavery. And it alludes to the sweet taste of God's promise and the coming deliverance. They knew that God would promise that one day he would bring them out of there. So the work of their labor was almost like bittersweet, so to speak, where that term comes from. It's bittersweet. It's a mix of the, of the maror and, and the haroset. 
Zorora is a shank bone, usually the shank bone of a lamb. Sometimes they'll put a piece of like roasted chicken on there because they don't eat lamb anymore. Um, shank bone that represents the Passover lamb. This bone was added because there is not sacrifice of a lamb made any longer. So um, this was added over, over the years through tradi tradition. It wasn't originally on the, on the Seder table, but um, they use it to represent uh, the lamb that would have been sacrificed. Beitza is a roasted hard-boiled egg. That was also added later. This represents mourning of the loss of the temple where the Paschal lamb would be sacrificed. So it's, it's representative of the fact that they can no longer go to the, the temple or the tabernacle and, and slaughter the lamb for the Passover. So now you have the shank bone and the roasted egg to uh, represent that, that mourning uh, and uh, what it would hold in place of the sacrifice. Okay, so those are the six things that you see on the Seder plate. If you look to the picture on the right, you see, you see the, it has the names there. There's the egg, the horseradish, the shank bone, the caroset, the bitter herbs, and the greens. Okay. So that's the Seder. Seder means order because everything's done in a specific order. In the beginning of the ceremony, you have what's called the woman of the house, right? After they, they wash hands, she'll, she'll, do, um, she'll read a, an excerpt or a blessing from the Haggadah, which is a compilation. It's called the, the telling or the story. And it's a compilation of, of biblical texts and also some outside rabbinical texts that uh, it's ritualistic in nature to um, the Passover, and um, she'll say a blessing and light the candles. And it's interesting when we're analyzing these symbolisms of what they mean in Judaism in a messianic light, because the reason why, even though the man of the house, right, right he, he wears the mitre or the, the something that's representative of a crown, he dresses in white because he, he dresses in a robe that the priest would have wore. And he wears uh, something symbolic of a crown like a king would have wore because the man and the father is the priest and king of his home. And so he's overseeing the ceremony. But the woman lights the candles that initiates the ceremony. Just as Christ had to be brought, he's the light of the world, but he was brought, the light was brought into the world through a woman, through Mary. And that's what initiated the whole thing, him being born as a man. So the woman starts, even though the man is reigning over the ceremony, before everything starts, they light the candles and light is being brought by the woman of the house. The matzah, it's, it's one of the most important parts of the whole thing. Preparation, um, they're, they're looking for the chametz. They're, they have to clear the house of all leaven before, before the evening of Passover. So everything has to be cleaned. Usually the, the women, it could be a family thing. Or usually the woman cleans the whole house. Make sure anything that has yeast in it has to come out. They got to throw it away. And um, so matzah is unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is essential to the ceremony. This bread will be eaten for the whole week, right? Because you have the Passover night and then you have hachamatz, the feast of unleavened bread for the whole week. Yeast, which makes bread rise and become puffed up, represents sin because sin and pride makes us feel puffed up and bigger than what we are as if we don't need God. So the eating of the unleavened bread and the, the ridding your household of the yeast is getting the sin out of your life and becoming humble before God. First Corinthians chapter five, verses one through eight is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should save his father's wife and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that have so done this deed. 
So Paul is saying to the Corinth, the church in Corinth, he's saying, listen, somebody's committed an act of fornication. He's like, I'm not there in person, but I'm, I'm there in spirit. And I'm already judging you for what's going on here. You, should, you guys aren't handling this correctly. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven, leaven if the whole lump, purge out therefore, or purge out therefore the old leaven, get rid of the yeast, get rid of the sin that's in your life, that ye may be a new lump, a new creation in Christ, as ye are unleavened. So he, Christ is what makes you unleavened. He's the one who took the sin from you with his, with his crucifixion. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul is identifying Jesus as the Paschal Lamb. Just like John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So this is what we're, an we're analyzing the Passover, what it represents sort of with Judaism, but we're really tying it into how it relates to Christ. And unleavened bread is the exact representation of who Jesus is. We're going to go a little further with this. There are interesting factors surrounding the matzah tosh. This is a bag with three separated pieces of bread in it. At the part of the ceremony called yachatz, which means to divide, the middle piece is removed and broken in half. One piece returns to the tosh or the bag, and the other is wrapped in linen or, or napkin, whatever's available at the time, and hidden to be found and eaten later. This is called the afikomen, that which comes after. There's three pieces of unleavened bread which represent something that's sinless. So unleavened means without sin. There's three in one bag. The middle one gets taken out and broken. And then it's wrapped in linen and hid somewhere in the house to be found later. If we analyze the mats further, we see that the bread has stripes and holes in it. It's got holes in it here. Little tiny holes. When they're making this matzah bread, they have to roll the bread out flat. And what they do is like they roll it with these little, little piercing things to pierce the bread. So that even when it's flat like this, it doesn't rise at all. Even though there's no yeast in it, they don't want like little air bubbles to rise. So they poke holes in it, right? Which creates a striping fashion on the parts that get a little bit more browned and then it has holes in it. So it's striped and pierced. Just like in scripture, when it says that Jesus Christ was pierced, right? And through his stripes, we are healed. If we analyze the matz further, we see that the bread has stripes and holes in it. It's amazing how this ceremony is so obviously displaying messianic imagery, yet most are oblivious to its implication. The children are asked to find the afikomen. The child who finds it is rewarded with a prize. The leader of the ceremony will then, at, at, at an appointed time, break the afikomen into pieces and pass it to those present at the table. This is the last food that will be consumed for the night before midnight. And then only the last cups of wine will be drank, which brings me to the next thing, the four cups. There are four cups of wine present at the Seder. All drink from them at different times during the ceremony. The four cups correspond to the four I will statements or promises from God 
written in Exodus 6, 6 through 8. Side note, God actually says, I will, seven times in these verses, which goes back to the heptatic structure that we were discussing through this series with the codes and how God works in sevens, the number of completion and perfection. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, this is Exodus I believe it's chapter six, verses five through eight. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. That's one I will. I will bring you out. I will rid you out of their bondage. Two, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Three, and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for people. Four, so these are the four promises. And I will, that's five I wills, be to you a God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will, six, bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will, seven, give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. So it's seven I wills, but it's mainly four promises. And these four cups of wine that are, that are partaken of throughout the ceremony at different times um, correspond to these four direct quotes from God. The first is Kadush, the cup of sanctification. So that's more towards the beginning of the ceremony. It, it pretty much, um, it's the presiding drink that pretty much blesses the whole ceremony. The second is Magid, the cup of deliverance. And they also, it's during the second cup before they drink of it, in which they dip their finger in the plagues. Because cup of wine, cup of wine represents joy, the joy of life. And although that it's a joyous accomplishment for God's promise to deliver the Hebrew people out of Egypt, right? Right? And they were finally getting what they asked for after hundreds of years of slavery. We dip our finger into the cup of wine and hit it to the plate 10 times for each of the 10 plagues. Because the Egyptians had to be sacrificed so that the Hebrews could be delivered. So through their deliverance, um, someone had to suffer. Just like the lamb had to suffer to atone for the sin and to cover the doorpost which we'll get to in a minute um when i when i speak to you guys dipping the finger and taking that little bit of wine out of the cup is the diminishment of the joy you shouldn't find joy just because your adversary is being dealt with and you're being delivered doesn't mean you find joy in the process in the destruction of another human being so they take out 10 drops for each of the 10 plagues that came against egypt The third is the Berkat Hamazon, which is the cup of redemption. And it's said by a, the Berkat Hamazon is a certain blessing that's, that's spoken. And the fourth is Halel, which is the cup of praise. So these are the four cups. And it's very interesting that Kadosh means sanctification. It's very interesting how it corresponds to uh, Christianity. And I think most Jews probably won't even know this. Cup of sanctification, deliverance. We're sanctified through Christ, right? We're made righteous. We're cleansed through his blood, through the blood of the lamb. It it sanctifies us. He delivers us. He delivers us from sin and death. He redeemed us, the cup of redemption. And and he blesses us because of that redemption. And then the fourth cup hasn't been drank yet in in the Christian standpoint, the cup of praise. That comes later. The last Passover. I believe that the Last Supper, as Christianity calls it, was in fact Jesus' final Seder meal with his friends. Because remember, Christ was crucified on the night of Passover. So this is the evening before that starts Passover day. They had the, at sundown, they ate their meal, and then Judas left to go betray Jesus. He was captured, arrested, put on an overnight trial. Then in the morning, they brought him to Pontius Pilate. They went through this whole process. And then by that evening sundown, he was dead. They put him in the grave. He was in there three days, three nights. And then he resurrected. 
So it, it was part of the old ceremony when Christ broke the unleavened bread, right? So remember the part with the Akikoman, right? So he, Christ broke it into pieces, the unleavened bread, which might not have been actually a matzah cracker. It could have been like a different type of bread, but just didn't have yeast in it. And he passed it to his disciples and they partook of it, right? I also believe that after the meal, because after the meal is when they eat the afikomen, and then that makes way for the third cup. So Christ picked up the third cup, the cup of redemption, which is the new covenant in his blood, the Barit Hadashah, the new covenant. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. For I have received, this is Paul speaking, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And this is where I'm going to partake in the communion. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, praises to God, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it, meaning once a year during Passover, as oft as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do, show the, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself or woman. Let a person examine themselves, And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So is it tradition in the Catholic Church and in the Baptist Church and in a lot of liturgical churches where, you know, once a month on the first Sunday, they drink some grape juice and they eat some bread? Yeah, it's, it's ritual. It's not really fitting. The true context is for both Jew and Gentile, that every day at the Passover to com commemorate God setting Israel free is to also commemorate the day that Christ took all sin and death at the cross and he set mankind free. That when we break that off, he come and, and we eat, we're partaking of the body that was broken for us, the, un the sinless body. The lamb without blemish. Not a bone was broken on Christ's body. So the idea of Passover, the lamb is slain and they were supposed to take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost. So that when God sent the angel of death to smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, if the blood of the lamb covered your household, death passed over you. That's where the term Passover comes from because death is passing over you. The same with Christ. He's our Passover lamb. And if his blood is covering our life, then death passes over us when we perish from the physical and we inherit everlasting life. That's the point to all this. And this is embedded in an ancient Jewish customary rit ritual of Passover, an ordinance from God. He made it law to do this. He even makes it law to eat, eat to eat the bitter herb with the matz. That they're commanded to do it. 
Just like Moses was commanded to strike the rock with the staff one time to bring forth the water for the land of Israel. And he was commanded the second time to speak to the rock, to bring forth the water. But he didn't listen to God and he struck the rock twice and he wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. These things are commanded because they foreshadow God's son in the person of Jesus the Christ. This is why it's so important. This is why this ritual has lasted thousands of years. Although it's a great accomplishment of what God did in redeeming the, the Hebrew people out of, out of Mitzrayim, which is bondage, out of Egypt, the whole reason why he did that, why he spared them, even though they were disobedient, was to bring forth the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Redeemer, the Goah, 